the Alston Brighton District City Councilor. Today is Thursday, May 17th. We are here with our good friends from the Boston Public Health Commission to discuss um, homeless services and recovery services uh, through the Boston Public Health Commission. I'd like to remind folks this is a public hearing. It is being both broadcast and recorded on RCN channel 82, Comcast channel 8, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. I'd like to ask folks in the chamber to silence their electronic devices. Um, at the conclusion of the departmental presentation and questions from my colleagues, we will take public testimony. There is a sign-in sheet to my left by the door. We ask that you state your name, affiliation, residence, and please mark the box uh, yes if you wish to testify. Uh, we we are uh, we still have several weeks remaining in the budget review. We ask all of our constituents and residents in the city of Boston if they'd like to participate. Uh, you can email the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. You can uh, send mail to us at uh, Boston City Hall, 1 City Hall Plaza, Boston, Mass, 02201, uh, care of the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, you can also attend a hearing on June 5th between the hours of 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. or after, if we have uh, many people, where we will uh, just have public testimony on any uh, aspect of the FY19 budget. Uh, uh, oh, he's talking to me. Uh, I'd like to uh, read the dockets into the record. Uh, dockets 0559 through 0563. Order for the fiscal year 19 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements. Uh, also dockets 0564 through, uh, and 0565, capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Lupi, <laughs> sorry, uh, and uh, for your presentation. Good morning, Councillor, and thank you again, Councillor Siomo, for, um, and all your colleagues on the Council for hosting the Boston Public Health Commission at our hearing this morning. I'm joined, uh, for the record, my name is Monica valdez Lupi, and I'm the Executive Director of the Boston Public Health Commission. And I'm joined this morning uh, by our Director of Administration and Finance, Grace Connolly, and Jen Tracy, who is the Director of the Mayor's Office of Recovery Services. As you mentioned, this morning we're going to go over the accomplishments and future initiatives from our Recovery Services and Homeless Services Bureau. Good morning, Councillor Wu. Uh, the city has a really strong system of care for individuals, families, and communities that have been affected by substance use disorders, and this continuum of care is extremely complex. We work very hard to make sure that this system is as easy to navigate as possible for those that need our support. We have an excellent partnership with the network of community-based providers throughout the cities, and through this um, partnership, we're able to offer programs and resources aimed at preventing addictions and supporting the treatment and recovery of those impacted by substance use disorders. We also provide a range of services to address homelessness, including emergency shelter, career counseling, job training, and transitional and permanent housing support services, along through the, again, through the commission and along with the network of providers. Um, the collaboration between both of these bureaus ensures that we're able to coordinate in a way that we offer uh, high, value, high quality critical services to vulnerable populations. Uh, in this slide, uh, there's an org chart that uh, shows where these two bureaus sit within the organizational structure. Again, I said that uh, the Bureau of Recovery Services works really closely with Jen Tracy, who leads our Mayor's Office of Recovery Services, to ensure that the programming and the resources that we offer are comprehensive and support prevention, treatment, recovery, and long-term long -term support services. 
Um, the Bureau of Homeless uh, Services uh, works with a network of shelters in the city to provide emergency shelter front door triage services and links to help the breaks of the cycle of homelessness. What I would like to ensure that you take away from our uh, presentation and the discussion in this morning is that there is a continuum of care. And um, the challenges between homelessness and addiction we know are intertwined. So through these two bureaus, we work ve uh, very collaboratively to engage our communities and guests and clients, engage our provider community, and transition our guests and clients to safe, supportive housing and long-term recovery. Uh, in this slide, we were offering you just a snapshot of some of the services that are offered by the Recovery Services Bureau, and there are a lot, but the two that I would like to uh, highlight that wouldn't have been possible without FY18 investments and support from Mayor Walsh include the following two. Uh, first, the PATHS program was able to extend walk-in hours of operation on weeknights and weekends to remain open until 7 p.m. on weekdays and from 8 to 4 p.m. on weekends. The Mobile Sharp team expanded from two FTEs to four FTEs to better cover evening and weekend hours. The team hired the additional two FTEs and expanded coverage to 7 p.m. to 7 uh, to 7 p.m. seven days a week. And uh, for FY18 to date, the Mobile Sharps team has collected over 29,000 sharps. Uh, in this slide, we highlight some of our youth prevention efforts uh, at the Commission and in collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Recovery Services. Uh, through Jen's leadership, we were able to partner with Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of Massachusetts to conduct the City of Boston's first ever youth substance use prevention needs assessment and strategic planning process. Uh, we were also, uh, through this process, able to um, assess the capacity of the existing youth substance use prevention services, identify gaps, and develop actionable recommendations. Uh, this report and the recommendations are in, in, final, in the final stages at this point. We've also, through our youth prevention efforts, been able to collaborate with 320 community partners to assess uh, prescription drug misuse and alcohol use among our young people, and over 200 uh, youth participated in our education and planning activities. I know something that we've um, worked with, uh, both the City Council and obviously uh, Jen and the Mayor, has been around our engagement center. Uh, if you haven't visited it before, I, I welcome you to come stop by and see the space. It's a welcoming drop-in center for individuals receiving services in our New Market Square neighborhood. We opened it last August as a six-month pilot, and so I wanted to share some of our learnings in this first phase. Um, as I mentioned, it's a safe space for participants to connect to the different homeless and recovery support services that are offered by the city and our partners, and to spend time in a low threshold atmosphere. Three primary goals of the pilot included to improve quality of life for individuals experiencing homelessness and addiction. Second, improve the quality of life for area residents and businesses. And third, to improve collaboration with area law enforcement and first responders. There are different comfort items that are offered through the center, including portable toilets and the newly added shower space, water, coffee, and light snacks. We also have inc um, increased and included recreational space, uh, both indoors and outdoors, to uh, facilitate socialization, access to TV, phone chargers, a quiet space for reading with books that have been donated by our partners at the Boston Public Library and workstations, which allow the guests who are visiting our clients to uh, access access email, um, look at job and work on job applications, and set up meetings with housing, housing advocates. Uh, program staff at the commission rotate through the center and offer support in um, navigating these different systems. We also work with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless to provide daily nursing services from 8 to 4 p.m. And this allows our participants to reconnect with health insurance, make primary care appointments, and receive routine medical care as needed. Acute patients are triaged to the ED, the uh, Healthcare for the Homeless main outpatient center, uh, with assistance from our staff. Uh, we collect um, uh, uh, metrics on how we're doing in terms of the uh, services that we offer, and we're also in the process of uh, developing a qualitative evaluation of the space in collaboration with the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. We're really pleased that Mayor Walsh has included $1.9 million in the FY19 budget directed to the Engagement Center to support this effort while we plan for a future permanent structure. 
Um, on this slide, uh, we wanted to highlight some of the work, again, by our street outreach teams that fall under recovery services. Uh, just as a reminder, these outreach teams were created through the investment of Mayor Walsh and our FY17 budget. So these teams are out on the streets seven days a week, canvassing our neighborhood in pairs to offer guidance to people who are in need of recovering homeless services, point them in the right direction if they're seeking shelter services or uh, recovery treatment support services. And we also make sure that the outreach each teams are trained on how to link individuals with the mayor's 311 for recovery services hotline. Uh, our, our team is an amazing team of staff. They know everyone who's on the street. They work really hard uh, to develop uh, relationships with individuals so that they, we can meet them where, where they are, and that's really important uh, for the clients that we're serving. Uh, the outreach teams also provide additional uh, support and capacity in picking up syringes that they might find uh, and, and do a lot of work engaging with neighborhood business leaders and providers to hear how they can support the work that they're doing in our communities. In this slide, we'll focus on our Homeless Services Bureau. So as I mentioned, there are a variety of programs that uh, fall under this bureau. They provide services related to, obviously, emergency shelter, health and behavioral health services, job readiness, training, substance use treatment, recovery support, and rapid rehousing. Last year, the bureau provided emergency shelter to approximately 741 men and women each night, which was a 13% increase over 2017. We worked with area shelters, which included Pine Street Inn, Pilgrim Shelter, the Knight Center, Boston Rescue Mission, and St. Francis House to ensure that every person seeking shelter had a place to stay. Both Woods Mullen, our women's shelter, and 112 Southampton Street, our men's shelter, provided support during the closure of Pilgrim Shelter in December of last year and helped respond to uh, the capacity problems that we saw at South Station during that extremely cold uh, stretch of weather that we experienced. This year, the Homeless Services Bureau supported over 250 individuals in housing search and stabilization services through structured case management, and the Bureau has already placed 33 clients in permanent housing in the month of April, and that uh, represents the highest number of placements so far uh, in 2018. We're also really proud of the renovations that we've been able to do at our women's shelter. Uh, they began in January of this year and they're slated to be completed by June uh, next month. Uh, once we're finished, the commission will be able to apply to become a licensed satellite mental health clinic, which is the first step that we need to take for us to provide billable mental health services. And this new office space will provide a safe, confidential meeting space for our guests and our staff and help increase case management services. Uh, hearing back from uh, a group, a community advisory group of female guests, they also uh, told us that they'd like a lounge space, uh, a more safe, dignified space uh, to, to stay. And so we're creating a lounge space uh, and a dispensary on the second and third floor guests for the guests to gain access to uh, toiletries as needed. There's gonna be improved new lighting, flooring, and painting, uh, including the dormitory space, which will make it a more therapeutic and safe environment for our women. Obviously, none of the work in the Bureau would be possible with ongo without ongoing community and provider engagement. And in this slide, we highlight some of the successful partnerships and relationships that we've developed with uh, Healthcare for the Homeless, Friends of Boston's Homeless, um, other area shelters, and obviously our partners under uh, Chief Sheila Dillon and DND and Jim Green. Uh, these collaborations have added to the success of our programs, uh, including front door triage, rapid rehousing, and workforce development. They also do a lot of work internally to work with and leverage other internal resources at the Health Commission uh, that guests and clients can tap into, including those that are offered through our recovery services, a mayor's office of recovery services, infectious disease bureau, and community initiatives bureau. Um, with uh, the Recovery Services Bureau, uh, we're able to address neighborhood issues and we're active members of a consortium uh, to look at implementing and improving care coordination. Um, um, in this final slide, we wanted to highlight some of our workforce development and access to employment initiatives. Uh, since uh, July of last year, partners have been meeting monthly to operationalize the grant uh, that we've received to create an access to employment network, which is a one-stop career center in the city. Uh, we've been able to train staff in Massachusetts' one-stop employment system, which is the state's career center database. And as of February of this year, we've enrolled 25 of our clients into the system as full members, and we've created orientations for guests and our staff and formalized the referral system. Um, so in closing, I, I want to thank 
uh, Mayor Walsh, Councillor Siomo, uh, Councillor Wu, our colleagues at the Office of Budget Management team for your continual support and, and service. I want to thank our Board of Health, we just met last night, uh, for the continuing guidance and leadership during this process. And um, we've worked closely with our board members uh, in preparing for this hearing and preparing our FY19 budget submission. Uh, obviously, I want to thank uh, Jen for her leadership through the Maros Office of Recovery Services and look forward to working with the council as we move forward through this fiscal year. Um, so I'll now turn it over to our Director of Administration and Finance, if that's okay, Grace, sure. uh, to talk through the budget for these two bureaus. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, my name is Grace Conley, Director of Administration and Finance for the Public Health Commission. I'm just going to very quickly give a brief overview of the commission as a whole and then these specific bureaus. Okay. So our proposed total budget for next year is approximately $171 million, which includes an appropriation request of $84.9 million, anticipated external funding totaling $46.5 million, and revenue primarily from third-party billing totaling $37.5 million. This is an increase of approximately $5.5 million um, from the City of Boston, 1.5 related to fixed costs, pension, health insurance, and such, and then 3.8 million related to new initiatives. So this includes the engagement center, youth outreach workers, EMS FTEs, as well as neighborhood trauma team funding. Um, this is a very robust budget and we're very excited about next year. In addition to that, the capital plan has also included some projects related to recovery services and homeless services, a new roof for 201 River Street, which houses our Lyman and Transitions program planning for the engagement center, a new elevator for Woods Mullen, which goes hand in hand with the renovations that are currently underway, as well as a generator for 112, which will support the men's shelter as well as the engagement center. And then these offer the possibilities to just give much better services to our clients. The FTEs, we have an increase of approximately 45 FTEs. The appropriation funds about 924 of our total, approximately 1,100 FTEs. We have 38 FTEs increasing this year from city funds. 19 are directly related to the engagement center. 14.42 are right in recovery services, and there are also five public safety officers that we're adding to ensure that the engagement center works with the homeless shelter and that we have a very robust safety contingent there to protect the clients as well as the employees. And then all our maintenance and capital funds will be used to continue to support our core public health functions and just promoting health and safety of the residents, the workers, and the visitors in Boston. Thank you. Great. Um, as you can see, I've been joined by City Council at large, uh, Michelle Wu, and she has an appointment, so I'm going to let you go. Are you go sure? ahead. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is really helpful. A lot of wonderful stuff happening. Um, I wanted, if possible, Grace, if we could dive a little bit more into the FTEs, just so I have a sense. I know I know we talk about EMS separately, and um, I, or they're they're before us fairly often. So in terms of the 1,100 FTEs, um, I see on the one of the supporting documents, 866 internal and 252 external. Um, could you give just a breakdown of how that falls by division? Absolutely. Just one moment. So in the um, Recovery Services Bureau for FY19, the proposed FTE total is 70.92. 17 or 70? Seven, 70. 70. 70.92. Yep. Okay, great. The current FTE total is 57.58. So the net increase to the Bureau of Recovery Services is 13.35. Um, and people move between grants and internal funding. So overall, um, that's the net increase for recovery. Child, adolescent, and family health, which we'll talk about this afternoon, is 97.63 for FY19 and 96.84 on internal. So that's an increase of 0.79. Community initiatives, 47.54 for FY19. 48.96 for FY18, so that's a small decrease of 1.42. EMS is 420 proposed for FY19 and 400 for FY18. Homeless services is 71.72, and that's the same for 18 and 19. 
Infectious disease is 23.09 for 19 and 24.64 for 18. So that's a decrease of 1.55. And then our public health service centers, those are the same for both years at 60.6. Those are the primary activities that support our programs. And then we have administration FTEs. For FY19, that's 109.25 versus FY18 at 104.25. And that five FTE difference, those are the public safety officers that will help support the engagement center. Okay. And then our property management department, it's 23 for 19 and 22 for 18. Um, so overall for FY19, it's 923.75 and 886.59. So that's a difference of 37.17. And those are the internally funded FTEs. Okay. And then the it's slightly different from the, I think from what we have in one of the, it says FY19 projected internals 866.4. Um, anyway, I'm sure, I, I know that your version is the correct one, but just um, it's, there's a slight difference in, in the materials that we had in, in one of the appendices on page 43. I don't know if you have the numbered version, but it's page 43 of our um, appendix. Um, Anyway, the, the larger reason I was asking, and this is really helpful to see the breakdown, it's, it's you all have so many different related but um, kind of very different missions under, under your umbrella. And I was curious in terms of the overtime amounts, what some of those um, were most associated with. For example, let me find it. I think the administrative overtime line, um, was, let's see, it says 285,663 in FY17, um, year to date in FY20, if FY18 is 321,000, and so you're projecting uh, 381,000 um, overtime in administration. So what, are, what does that primarily go to, or which, is it just from the administrative division that you described earlier, or does it kind of come from everything? Administration, that's primarily public safety. They're really the only people in that bucket that have Got overtime. Um, <laughs> plan vacation, et cetera, as well when we have unexpected events that happen. Okay. So that's primarily public safety. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the other bucket of questions I, that I had, um, I had two other small things. One around your... Um, external or your vendors that you have relationships with. And it looks like comparing some of the documents here that um, you have $16.5 million of contracts with MWBE, uh, minority and women owned business enterprises. And does that make up about 50% of your contracts? Or we have another appendix that has another that has $33 million in external contracts. I guess the question is how many of your dollars that are going out into the community are in this MWBE bucket, which it seems is fairly significant. It is. Let me just take a moment and find that data, please. Mm -hmm. Councillor, would it be okay if I got that data oh, to you? Sure. I want to make sure I aggregate it because our line item budget isn't necessarily broken down got by it, got contracts. It. Okay. I can um, get that directly to you. That's wonderful. Um, I mean, I, I, it seems just from looking at a lot of other budgets <laughs> this year and, and in previous years that you all are, are putting some focus on this. Air, on this, I was curious if to, as to whether you have internal um, policies and procedures that specifically focus on supplier diversity or um, how, how you're getting to such a result? We do actually. We actually just posted a procurement to pay director and within the job description there's a category to focus on equitable procurement practices. Got it. So this is going to be a key focus for us in the coming years. We've also pulled down a gear report um, 
for contracting for equity that we're going to use as the basis to revamp our policies and procedures just to make sure that we're focusing on women women owned businesses minority owned businesses and looking at veteran owned businesses focusing more on locally owned businesses yep. as well to make sure we're using our dollars more effectively in the community for our Great. smaller business community could you share when you have that policy um, mm -hmm. I would love to find ways if the council can help adapt that for the larger city um, the council just passed last year our uh, equity and opportunity and contracting ordinance, which doesn't technically apply to you all, uh, but I think we may be behind even in what you're doing, so we'd love to, to ratchet it up. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and then finally, just in terms of um, the neighborhood trauma teams, it sounds like you're adding one, to, now there's five total, or is it going from five to six now, um, and, and what will the, is it a geographic focus? What, what will the um, direction for that new team be? That's right. So we currently have five, and of FY19, we re, uh, received uh, additional resources, and the, the plan is to go from five to six. And what we know from the data that the trauma teams collect is that we need an additional team in Dorchester. So uh, pending final approval from the city council, we'll begin to uh, plan on. Uh, Are all the team. teams... Um how many teams are already in Dorchester versus There's other one team in Dorchester Got it. now, okay. and there are teams in Mattapan, Roxbury, East Boston, and Jamaica Plain. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, just to follow, oh, and we've been joined by District City Councilor Tim McCarthy as well. Uh, just to follow up, uh, your, you have, uh, I guess what you would term street workers, your outreach workers. And, you know, obviously BCYF has street workers. Is there any collaboration between the two? Good question. We actually work closely with Commissioner uh, Morales when we reconstituted, redesigned the neighborhood trauma response teams. We mm -hmm. worked with Commissioner Morales because his street workers are often on uh, the first uh, on the scene along with BPD and mm -hmm. Boston EMS. Mm -hmm. um, so we did, we did collaborate with um, Commissioner and his team around how they connect to the work that we were doing through our neighborhood trauma teams. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we've also done um, training and work with his team. Uh, and the street outreach teams that are in our Recovery Services Bureau. Uh, right. So it's been a very, um, I think it's been a really productive, collaborative right. yeah, uh, I think process. That, yeah, I would say that's imperative because we know uh, most court involved, especially young people, if we want to intervene, most court involved have uh, drug connections as well and, and a lot of homelessness as well. So it's great. To, to keep that collaboration going and cross-training maybe. Um, I just wanted to um, do some housekeeping on, on budget stuff and uh, some of the information we received. Um, for example, in the packet, it said on page, um, I'm gonna try 69, we, we, 60, 69 or 70. Oh, and, and we've since been joined by Councillor Frank Baker as well. So it, on, oh, I'm sorry, let me grab this. It says um, in the pre-hearing request, the BPHC's external funds are expected to decrease by 954-240, and we actually on when we did the math, it might just be a math error, but uh, we're actually increasing by 921, I believe. Can you um, explain maybe what happened in that calculation? There were two things. On the external spreadsheet, there was a formula error. One of the cells wasn't actually captured okay. in the subtotal. Okay. So the actual positive variance for FY19 versus 18 is 961.585 increase in external funding okay. and the write-up summary of the FY 2019 external funds changes that was a version control issue okay someone was writing it and then the computer right. froze and then okay. <laughs> technology uh, but in fact it's it's actually an increase it right? is correct it is, is it is an increase and, and it's a, yeah and, and um, you know let me applaud the mayor for uh, Great investments, increased investments, especially in, in homeless. And, you know, we've had a lot of leadership come out of our council with uh, Councillor Nisa Sabi George and, 
and, and others. Um, Frank Baker is here as well with recovery, and we're making significant investments there, which uh, I hope will bear fruit. Um, there was a, I'm sorry, I have too many papers here and I can't find it. <laughs> My questions. Oh. Um, so that clears up that one. So we're actually a net positive in the external. Um, there's also uh, a number, the number is different, what our budget team calculated um, on page three, uh, three to four of our hearing packet. The 961, we have 961, 587, and I think our calculations, are, is it still just um, spreadsheet maybe errors? It's not significantly different, but I just wanted to prevent, you know, discussion over the extraneous numbers. That was the cell that was missed. Gotcha. So okay. the 961, 587, and when I added back in that cell, we came to 961, 585, and that was just rounding. Right. Okay. I, I'm going to shift a little bit to the capital budget because, uh, gee, several years ago, the, um, the Trilogy project, uh, Trinity project, sorry, thank you, Trinity project, and wanted to get a status update on that uh, you know we were told during you know those hearings when we gave them um, some credits and, and other benefits to build this project that they would house um, um, the EMS uh, training facility there would be so could you give me an update uh, and if we need to, kind of follow up with the BRA maybe on what their, if anything's changed. So thanks for this question. I know this is something that uh, has been evolving and that I inherited when I first yes, arrived two have. years <laughs> ago. So I can say that, uh, you know, as part of the due diligence that Grace and I have been doing with our team in administration and uh, finance, we know that the project is really um, large and complicated, both legally and financially. So there are a couple different parties, as you mentioned, that were involved, Trinity, Boston Medical Center, and some ongoing issues that are at play. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually not prepared at this point okay. in time to uh, share any updates of, of uh, the discussions, but happy to come back uh, when we're ready to share an update yeah. with all of you on, right. on any plans that uh, okay. have been developed before. Right. I mean, I would have to review the hearing because it was so long ago, but I would suggest that someone review that hearing where they made commitments to the city in order to get the benefits that w made this a feasible project. Uh, I know it, it, it included a lot of affordable housing, which we desperately need more of, but it also included community benefits for the city of Boston, for EMS specifically, and I want to make sure that, you know, they're held accountable for those commitments. Um, and they were made in less good times, I would add. Mm -hmm. And we're in much better times, much better uh, circumstances, so I, I want to make sure that those commitments are, are enforced. Um, so when you do have more information, um, if you could get us some kind of documentation and if it deviates from commitments that were made, you know, we'll have our central staff maybe research that and your staff. We just want to make sure that uh, that developer is held accountable for those commitments because we all voted to support it based on a lot of factors. but. You know, the affordable housing was a huge piece, but also the benefit to our EMS um, workers and, and staff. No, thank you, thank you for your uh, focus and, and attention on this. We'll go back, we'll revisit the hearing as you've suggested, um, deliberations, and, and you're right. I mean, I think that's part of the due diligence that has to go into looking right. at how the properties were um, 
valued right. at that point in time because we know things have ch conditions have changed. Absolutely. So uh, as soon as we're able to uh, share something with you, we'll be sure Correct. to look Great. back. Appre appreciate it. And uh, we've been joined by City Council at Large, Anissa Sabi George, Councillor Kim Janey, Councillor Matt O'Malley. Not sure if in that order. <laughs> so, um, I but I know that Tim McCarthy has the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome. I was listening uh, in my office, so I appreciate everything. Uh, my, I did have some line of questioning on the uh, Trinity project. I was, I was there at that hearing, um, and I know that there were some promises made. So I, I just have to echo what uh, Councillor Siomo said that uh, you know there were some promises about square footage and things like that uh, regarding EMS benefits. So we need to make sure we hold their feet to the fire. So that was one of my questions. My, my really, the only other question that I had was about the Harbor Island study. Um, can you dig a little deeper into exactly um, what that is? We, we had our uh, public works hearing yesterday. Um, they have the money in the capital to rebuild the bridge. I know there's some issues with Quincy and everything else, but uh, last year, and I'd like, actually like to do it again, um, Councilor Sabi George and uh, Councilor Baker and I went out to the island um, and took a walk through the facilities, and that was last year, um, just months after it was evacuated, um, and now uh, a year later with, uh, you know, open to weather and everything else, it's probably, we're probably looking at a significant amount of money to get that shelter and that facility uh, up to where uh, it needs to be. Um, and that obviously needs to be done before the ribbon gets cut for the bridge. Um, so can you just uh, dive in a little deeper on what exactly the Harbor Island study is? Um, thank you, Councillor. I'm glad that you all had a chance to go out to uh, Long Island last year and agree that with the recent weather, uh, there probably have uh, been even more significant uh, issues related to the facilities on the island. On the Harbor Island project, I'm actually, uh, the, the way that um, the work has been structured is that Chief Marti uh, obviously Chief Osgood is uh, our lead, the mayor's lead on uh, discussions and planning around the reconstruction of the bridge. And then from our Health and Human Services Cabinet, Chief Marty Martinez uh, and, our, and Jen Tracy, who's the director of the Mayor's Office of Recovery Services, have been leading uh, the discussions around the, the service development piece. So I'm actually going to defer to Jen on this particular question. Sure. Um, so I think you asked, you know, the right questions. The, the, the dollars that have been put aside mm -hmm. um, for the Harbor Island study are to do just that, to assess all of the facilities on the island and to begin the process of coordinating the feedback that we need um, to gather from across sectors and partners and um, across the uh, region around services. Okay. Okay, so, and that's gonna start, so the, the, uh, the actual study is being run through PFD, I saw that, and that's gonna be, that, that'll start now, I'm guessing? Okay. So the dollars are allocated July 1st, okay, um, but certainly the pre, you know, right. the, the pre-meetings right. and, and organizing is starting, um, has started in January when the when the mayor made his announcement. Thank you very much. But I would like to get out there one more time. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Council Baker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Thanks for coming out. Jen, the, the dollars were um, they were committed. How much how much did we commit to this study for the Harbor Island study? Is that for the for, for a campus or, or what we need to do out on uh, Long Island? A million dollars, one, uh, one, one million, million was, was put aside to, and that's both a property assessment. Uh -huh. So, um, Councilor McCarthy's point about, you know, what condition are the buildings in? Um, what are we looking at after not being there? Uh, but just maintaining the grounds. That's what the million dollars will be used for, as well as starting the planning process for convening and coordinating um, the, the research that we need to do and the feedback uh, from our state partners and um, community partners. So we have, we have a million to figure out what, what condition the buildings are in and what, what we could potentially um, relocate for services or create new services over there with that million. Right. Good, good. Um, can you talk, oh, oh, wh whoever wants to talk about, um, and I'm sorry I missed the, the slideshow, I was running a little bit late. Can you, can you talk about under the homeless services access to employment in the first the top part is integrated housing and employment services. Like, how are we doing in that area with, with 
you know, what's the access for people to, to gain housing? Is it successful and, and it's being run out of the engagement center, I assume? So uh, on the housing, we actually have had some success. Let me pull my notes from the uh, slides because, uh, you know, as a system of providers, we had rolled out, ra uh, rolled out rapid rehousing and mm -hmm. front door triage. And so let me pull some of the numbers that I had highlighted in the remarks. So um, we were able to uh, support over 250 individuals mm -hmm. that w came through both of our uh, shelters at Woods Mullen and also at 112 Southampton Street, our men's shelter, in terms of housing search and stabilization, so they get assigned a case manager. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they were able to place 33 33 clients so far in permanent housing. That was 33, I believe, in the month of April, which is the highest number of any month uh, to date in oh, 2018. Good, and, and the integrated housing, is that like the, the model that Pine Street is doing, or like is, is that the model that they're going into? I'm actually not familiar with the integrated model that you're referring okay, yeah, well, to. Well, they, they, they probably are, you know, okay. if, we're, if we're able to locate them. And, um, can we talk about the the um, the Southampton, not the Southampton, the um, in back? What is it called? The engagement, engagement center. center. Can sure. we talk about that? It says um, uh, programming and siting study for permanent engagement center. It, would that be? Are we looking at that? Making that site permanent? Can we just talk maybe a bit about that study? Sure. Um, as, wants to. as I mentioned in the earlier remarks, we had uh, rolled, we had opened the engagement center last August, and mm -hmm. it was in a pilot phase. So, we've been working with Jen and Devin Larkin in our bureau, uh, and with uh, the mayor's um, office to uh, collect different measures on how the engagement center has been used. Uh, we're also doing a qualitative study, so uh, talking with clients, uh, people in the neighborhood, about uh, their uh, thoughts on how uh, the engagement center has gone. It has been, I think, successful in terms of bringing people in. Um, on any given day, uh, we have 100 uh, individuals who are in the engagement center. And so what we'll do is uh, go through the process of looking at all of the different data that have been collected, the conversations that uh, Jen, Devin, and I have had with partners who have helped us with the engagement center, and then in FY19, go through a, a more structured planning process and what to do based on what we've learned in this okay. pilot phase. And build it to suit the, new, the needs that the data is, is um, showing? Yes. Okay. Um, can we talk a little bit about, uh, so, so those studies also are talking about EMS training academies and EMS, um, you know, just an EMS academy study. Are those, and I know that you guys aren't necessarily prepared uh, for the, the Trinity deal, but that Trinity deal was, they were supposed to build out the, the, e, the EMS training I believe training academy for us. Am I correct? No. You... I think that was part of the, that may have been part of their initial conversations, yeah, it, and it's. So it's probably safe to say that that deal is probably stalled. That's why we're that's why we're spending the money here because the need is outpacing the. Okay. And with the I additional think, yeah. cadets that we have uh, through the increase in Chief Hooley's budget, mm -hmm. you know, the EMS. Um, the, the participants in the training program, I think they deserve, uh, I think, a state-of-the-art uh, training space. So I think that's why there's been an investment on the capital side. Yeah, so we're, we're going to, ex the existing space, we'll, we'll spend it there. We'll actually have a chance to hear more from Chief Hooley, I believe, on Monday, and we okay. can dig a little bit deeper on, on okay, the details then. Okay, good. And, and Grace, do you have a sense of, oh, the chairman's gone, I can just keep going. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Grace. <laughs> Do you, <laughs> did he really? Um, Grace, do you have a sense of what we spend on medical waste disposal, like the, between the shops and, and everything that's that's called medical waste? How do we dispose of it? Where does it go? And what's what would be like a, an approximate of how much we spend on that? 
I don't know the amount we spend on that, but I can certainly track that down. As for the sharps disposals, we actually have a contractor who takes the sharps disposals for us. Uh -huh. So that's a contracted service to make sure they're handled appropriately as biohazard waste and boxed up and, and carted away appropriately. But I can get you the number on what we spend across the commission for that. Do you know what the number is just for the sharps disposal? I do not. Okay. But I can get that to you soon. Okay. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm past my I'm time. Yep. <laughs> Councillor Janey. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, on, can you, I've got a lot, I guess. Um, the safe injection facilities, people are discussing that across the Commonwealth. Can you just tell me what the Public Health Commission's position is on that? Uh, the Public Health Commission's focus uh, similar to is is similar to the mayor's, which is really focused on uh, ultimately recovery services. Uh, through the health department, we provide different harm reduction uh, services. So, through our AHO program, uh, we we also that's our needle exchange and harm reduction uh, service. Uh, delivery program, and we also uh, provide um, a one-stop center through PATHS to help individuals and family members, and there's a link now with 311 to PATHS, uh, for individuals who are ready to seek treatment and care. And so we've been focused on harm reduction and, and access to treatment, uh, and that is the mayor's position as well. Um, in terms of the needle exchange, where, where are those located and how are those decisions being made? So A Hope is uh, in our Finland building, uh, which is next door to um, Healthcare for the Homeless. So that's on site. Uh, we also, through a partnership uh, with Healthcare for the Homeless and MGH, the, the craft center, we operate a mobile van called the Care Zone. And on that van, we have uh, typically a clinician from Healthcare for the Homeless and one of our staff from A Hope. And so we're able to uh, provide uh, do needle exchange through the Care Zone van as well. Um, Where does the Care Van, the Care Zone van, go, and who decides that? So currently, uh, they're, they're also in a pilot phase that's, uh, I believe, slated to wrap up. It was a six-month pilot phase. The two locations, based on the public health data that we had uh, and conversations and planning with uh, Elsie Tavares, who leads the uh, craft center, and Healthcare for the Homeless, and Jen Tracy uh, in the Office of Recovery Services, really, really zeroed in in two locations for this initial pilot, so the Dudley Street, uh, neighborhood and then also uh, downtown West End. And where in Dudley Street? It's right near Dudley Station. Uh, it's in a lot. I can't remember the exact address. I'm looking at Jen to see if you remember. I can get that for you though. Um, and this was based on the data you mentioned? Yes. Was there involvement with the main streets of that area or residents in that area as to whether or not this was the appropriate location? Yes, the commission actually worked really closely with our colleagues in the Office of Neighborhood Services uh, to facilitate introductory meetings between the craft center um, staff and also key uh, business civic leaders in both neighborhoods uh, so that they knew what the initial thinking and plans were uh, and to answer any questions. I know that one of the uh, questions that came up that they wanted to, the, the team wanted to quickly dispel was that it wasn't a mobile safe injection site. Uh, really, this was a van to meet uh, some of the toughest individuals uh, where they're at and to provide a service and a linkage point. They don't turn anyone away uh, on the van. So we did that uh, listening to and in partnership with uh, the neighborhood. Yeah, I think it's really important to make sure that we have uh, recovery services um, for individuals who, who need those services. Um, so I'm grateful for the work that you're doing. I think there's also a tension between residents and, and business owners when it comes to where those services should be placed. Um, right now, I know there, there are um, businesses in the Dudley area anyway who are having difficulty um, with this issue. And I'm wondering if you can just speak to um, how your office is being uh, responded, how your office is responding to these concerns or how the commission is responding to these concerns, particularly around the small businesses in the area. So again, we work, we work really closely 
uh, with Jerome Smith's team and ONS when there are concerns like that with the neighborhood liaison. They're the ones who are embedded in the neighborhoods uh, day in and day out. And we, when there are issues or concerns around things like recovery services or homelessness or if they're finding needles, the staff at the commission through our bureau director, Devin Larkin, and also Jen Tracy and Brendan Little in the Office of Recovery Services, we're always willing to meet. Uh, with the business leaders. I mean, one great example, uh, I think, that I would highlight is the work that we did in collaboration with the New Market uh, business uh, district and partners uh, there. They were definitely involved in the planning and development of the engagement center. So I think you're raising a good point in terms of um, you know, partnering with businesses and, and making sure that we uh, hear their concerns and that we're working to support them in addressing them. Um, and I've had the opportunity to visit a couple of um, house, housing sites for individuals in recovery, uh, which was pretty good. Most recently, it was the Hope House. Mm -hmm. I was there for, I think, maybe their ribbon cutting. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the individuals living there just praised what was happening in terms of the, the support that they're receiving. And so I think that's really good. I was struck um, each time, though, that the residents don't reflect the diversity of the, the city or the neighborhood in which they are. And, um, you know, I know substance abuse is an issue that affects everyone, regardless of race, religion, um, gender, et cetera. But I'm wondering how individuals of color in communities of color, so we have these these sites that are providing good services for those in recovery, but the, the surrounding community, which often struggles with substance abuse, doesn't seem to have access to these sites. Can you speak to why that is? Well, I can speak to, and I, I know that Fred at the Hope House uh, had a successful uh, blue ribbon. They, they had a cutting because of the additional uh, beds that they were able to uh, provide. And I think this issue that you raise in terms of equitable access uh, to treatment and recovery services is an important one. I know at the commission what I'm proud uh, to share, and we can share the resources with you offline, uh, is that uh, through our Bureau of Recovery Services, we uh, have many, if not all, of our materials are offered uh, in multiple languages. Uh, we know from the state data in terms of the next phase of their work uh, that um, Latinos uh, are, um, in terms of racial ethnic groups, they're, they're seeing an increase in terms of the impact of uh, the opioid epidemic on Latinos. Uh, we do overdose prevention trainings uh, in Spanish. We have materials, uh, modules online that are also in Spanish. And so this is something that we take very seriously. Uh, the issues that you raise in terms of access, uh, I think is, are, are important and we'd be happy to work with you to, uh, to try to understand uh, where uh, there are barriers and how we can work with you uh, to address them. Okay, and um, thank you, that's it for now. I'll wait to the second round. Thank you, Chair, and thank you um, all of you for being here as well as your team that's joined you um, today in the audience. I have some questions about um, our guests, our individuals who seek services in our shelters. I, I see that we've got an average number of 517 at Southampton Street, 224 at Woods Mullen. Can you talk a little bit about the breakdown on where these individuals are coming from? What, what's their community of origin? Mm -hmm. The majority of the clients that we, we actually see at the both shelters are Boston um, residents. I'm gonna try to see if I can get that breakout for you in terms of the shelter guests. So the community of origin data that we've been able, I've been able to see um, is showing that the trend is actually going majority non-Boston residents for community of origin. I don't have that right in front of me, Counselor. I apologize that I can't find it. Okay, we can, um, we can maybe okay. circle back to it afterwards. Um, how much does it cost for a night stay? What is the per individual cost of doing 
business of, of servicing an individual who's experiencing homelessness in one of our shelters. I don't know if we have that readily available in terms of the cost. Um, the, I think what I understand you, your question, which is a good one, is how much does it cost per guest per night yep. uh, to house them? And that, I'm, I'm watching Grace take notes, is something that we might have to uh, provide to you afterwards. All right, how much do we spend or have budgeted for the Southampton Street Shelter? Grace is going to pull that budget out. And then also on the Woods Mullen Shelter. Okay. And then while that's being pulled up, how much do we get reimbursed per bed per night from the state? So let's take that question one by one. So um, budget for each shelter and then reimbursement uh, for the beds. I don't have the shelters broken out. I can get that to you. Well, how much is it for both shelters then? The total for the, the homeless bureau is $6.6 .6 for next year. For, this is for Southampton and Woods Mullen? And Woods Mullen for Six both shelters. Point, I'm sorry. 6632401 is the FY19 amount. And then the external funding for that for homeless services is 9899423. 9889. 9899423. <laughs> Four, two, three. I'm going to do a little bit of math math between my next. Um, it's about $16.5 million total for, for the you. Homeless Services Bureau. And, but that, th th those are all services that are directly associated with each of the shelters. They are. That's just specifically related to homeless services. It's the floor counselors. It's the right. three meals a day. It's the front door Excellent. triage, Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate that. Thank you. And then what do, we, what do we receive from the state for reimbursement on uh, providing shelter beds? I can get you that data in just a moment. And then as we, um, I mean, I'll, I'll do a little, I'll pull up my, the 2000, and, off the top of my head, the 2016 data on community of origin shows that about 50% of the residents um, or guests at our two shelters, 50, about 50% of them come from outside of the city of Boston, noted as a community of origin. And in an earlier budget hearing with the Department DND, Chief Dillon mentioned that it's closer to 60 uh, come from outside the city of Boston. And, and there is, through the intake and the triage process at the front door, data collected on what communities um, and states and other places that they're arriving from. Um, and I, I am looking for a very direct correlation of the cost of caring for our residents uh, that have become homeless or experiencing homelessness, um, as well as uh, folks from other places. I'm, I'm even more specifically interested in the number of individuals that we're caring for as they experience homelessness that are from the city of Quincy. Okay. And I can tell you I have a huge binder here with a lot of data and metrics, and that particular data point is not in this binder. So I can uh, get that community of origin information for you, and I understand the question to be specifically around uh, the uh, individuals who uh, have Quincy. Great. Thank you. And okay. I, I know I've hit my... Oh, we've got something. Can so the DATD funding we get, this is specifically from the state for the shelters. So for the 112 Southampton, that's four four seven eight eight four one. Say that one more time. Four 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 seven eight eight four one. And then we also have a pot of money for permanent housing, and that's one nine nine one oh one. And then the Woods Mullen piece is two zero four four one nine four. And say that number one more time. Two zero four four one nine four. All total that's approximately six point seven million dollars from DHCD. And then the balance, which is about $10 million. It's third-party billing. It's some private grants. It's, um, you know, rapid rehousing money, behavioral health. It's mental health services. Right. It's a, a whole hodgepodge of things we, we've managed to parse together. Grace, thank you. Thank you. Council O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, <laughs> ladies. Director Lupe, I promise not to call you Dr. Lupe this year as I have. It was I a promotion. <laughs> I reveled in it. You, you, you should get an honorary doctorate in my book. So uh, <laughs> great to be with you all. Thank you for the great work you do. Thank you, Chief Martinez, Chief Hooley, your colleagues sitting behind you, and as well as those behind me. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad that we're 
um, breaking the, the public health budget meetings into a series. So, you know, there's a lot we want to cover, and I'll, I'll stay focused on homeless and recovery services. Uh, first of all, well done. This is obviously one of the biggest issues we're dealing with as a city, and I know <laughs> the mayor is deeply committed to doing all he can um, to help those who are struggling, and, and particularly those with a dual diagnosis, mental health and substance abuse, which often leads to homelessness as well. So I apologize for being late. You may have gone over this. Um, has, has our homeless population decreased? There, was that alluded to in a Globe article earlier this week? At, at least the snapshot of the census that, that you guys do every year? I think in the census data, I have to double check that. That was, let me just double check so I have the right numbers for you. So they just released it, uh, and it looks like um, it fell by 3% this year as compared to last year at the same time that they did the census. So what are those numbers? So um, in this year, uh, it was 6,146. And last year, 2017, 6,327. Okay, and well, that's good news. You know, anecdotally, it seems like the numbers are growing. I spend a fair amount of time walking, jogging around, particularly downtown neighborhoods. Um, so that that's powerful to hear. Do you have sort of, uh, is it corroborated by serving more people in our do, do we have the number of people that we've served in Woods Mullen and all of our shelters? Has this, that increased? You know, this is actually something that we're working on with uh, Chief Dillon um, be, because of what you've highlighted. It, you, despite the decrease by 3% in the homeless census count, uh, the number of people using emer emergency shelter did increase by 1%, okay. uh, as uh, did the number of single adults uh, sleeping on the street. That number fell uh, According to the data, we have 12%. Uh, Chief D Dillon and DND uh, have announced that there was an RFP uh, to look at issues around homelessness and, and our uh, shelter system across the city, and they have selected through their procurement a California-based consulting firm, uh, Focus Strategies, to help us redesign and modernize uh, our emergency shelter system. Okay. And you said the emergency shelter housing had increased? Can you give me those numbers? It did increase, and I did give you those numbers um, from our presentation. So, if, I, if it's in the packet, I can find it's it. It's in uh, the remarks. Let me just. Dem this is demand up 13 percent over 2017. Yes. Yeah, okay. that's right. It was a 13 percent so, increase okay. uh, at both of our shelters. Great. Okay. Um, one of the slides you talk about um, referrals for services. 520 referrals made from BPD. Does that mean if a um, police officer finds someone in, who they, they think may be under the influence or may be dealing with addiction, they would call public health? They can call 311. 311. Can, yes, there are multiple routes um, to working with them. And I don't know, Jen, if you want to say more about the collaboration with BPD. Sure. I think that's from the PowerPoint. Um, that's a uh, pilot that we are doing with the Boston Police Department drug unit. Um, opiate overdose unit down in the uh, Mascas uh, neighborhood, and um, it's a diversion program. Okay. So police are uh, coming in contact with um, low-level drug offenders and uh, providing them with a summons, um, but in the meantime, to appear at PATH's program to receive um, assessment and Good. services. Good. And that's terrific, and I appreciate it. Ten percent of the referral sought services, which means 90% didn't. Does that mean it's up to the individual whether or not they want to follow through for services? In other words, an officer cannot mandate services with a quick diagnosis and right for this pilot. You. For this pilot, it was um, trying out um, just using another tool, okay. uh, really identifying another tool that we okay. could use so the teeth behind it aren't um, aren't there in the okay. same way. And how, I apologize if you went over this or if it's in the packet. How many overdoses did we have in the year, in last year in Boston? Mm -hmm. So according to our EMS data in 2017, uh, we had uh, 3,624 narcotic-related incidents. Uh, and in 2018, the number was at 2,879 to date. I'm sorry, 2,879? 2, 2, to date. For this May year. 17th. 
January 1st through May 17th. We're at from it's fiscal year. I think oh, this is oh, by fiscal year. So we're so June to June, June 30th yeah, to see. July 1st or vice versa. Okay. So we're we will likely be at around the same as last year. That is uh, well. That's that's what it's showing. Let me just double check that I have that right. Okay. And again, I mean, I think. You guys are doing such important work, and, you, and I think you're probably managing it or, or um, measuring it better than you have. You have more tools, you have more ways to count, and that's really important. So I'm not looking to, you know, underscore that things have gone up or down, but it's just important to get the right information. Actually, you know, I think I gave the incorrect number. So that was 2016. It was uh, 2,879 narcotic-related rel illness cases. In 2017, EMS responded to 3,624. Okay. And in this binder, I actually do have that Chief Hooley's uh, weekly report that we have. So... Uh, this is year to date. So this is from January uh, to May 9th, January 1st to May 9th. The total cases are at 1,153. I'd have to go back and provide the information from the last part of last year to get you by fiscal year. Okay. So, it's, so a significant jump from 2016 to 2017, but we're probably... Well, I, I assume it spikes in the summer and when the weather's nicer, so it seems to be it's, it's on par for what it was last year, if it were 11.53 through May 9th. In Just, terms of total numbers, it's yeah. comparable. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, 29,000 syringes were collected by four FTEs. Was it uh, that is the that is the um, the mobile mobile sharps, and yep. then we also collect syringes uh, through different programs. So, for example, through our AHO program, um, last year they um, collected or disposed of 297,500 syringes through that program. In an average week at AHO, they collect approximately 7,000. Um, in FY18, across the city. Um, over 470,000 uh, syringes have wow. been uh, collected, and that's across AHOPE uh, through connections through 311, our uh, kiosks that Grace talked about in terms of what we collect, our outreach teams, and then other city departments. Wow, so that is significant. And has that number grown over last year? I guess I'm looking more for sort of trends in these things. I I'm sure the number's grown because we've had, and you've sort of led, and more people are picking them up. So it's not necessarily reflective of an increase of use, although that probably is happening as well. But the fact that we're putting more resources to cleaning them up. There I are a think. lot of resources that have been invested with Mary yeah. Walsh um, to, uh, it, to uh, increase the capacity across city departments. We actually do a lot of intentional work with other city departments. We've done trainings and work with Parks uh, Commissioner Cook. At Parks and Rec, we've done uh, trainings for the facilities team at BPS okay, great. around safe needle uh, disposal. So this is something that we um, train and uh, do in partnership with other departments. Okay, great. My, my final question for this round is, I think you just touched upon it. One of the things I was very proud to have introduced 2011 was a um, hearing order for prescription um, drug drop-off boxes, and we got the first one that I know of uh, in the E5 police station. Uh, are those in all police stations now? Jen is saying yes. Yeah. And yes. Jen, are we seeing, um, are, they, are they being well used? How often do they fill up? You know, I'd have to get you that information because yeah. BPD handles the disposal of that, but we could check with. Oh, they don't give it over to you guys? They just. BPD. Okay. Boston Police Department. Yeah. Okay. And um, is there any thought of increasing those in maybe libraries or other municipal buildings, community centers? Not at this time. Okay. Per I mean, again, if, if, if we don't need, if, if they're overflown then, or overflowing, perhaps we should look at expanding them. But I'd love to maybe follow up offline and just get some more of those statistics because I think it's a, I have heard from people, you know, who know that I care about the environment saying, I, I want to get rid of these drugs. I don't want to flush them down the toilet. What should I do? And right. it's better to get so them out of their, their um, cabinet in their bathroom. Absolutely. Um, and 24-7 access um, at, in every neighborhood right now is where they are. So Good. Um, okay. Thank you, Jen. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Presley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone.
Uh, thank you for being here and echoing my colleagues uh, for what you do every day. Um, I just was curious, um, with our shelter guests, are they surveyed in any way? Is, do, is there a, a town hall meeting? Do you survey them about their experiences? Have you asked them what led to them experiencing homelessness? Uh, you know, anecdotally, you know, I, I uh, presume that, uh, you know, eviction, fire, um, just trying to get a sense of, I know we've made great strides on veterans homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, it's also been my experience and one of the things I'm looking to address in that chronically homeless category are individuals experiencing homelessness who have criminal records, who are being released from correctional facilities directly to shelter. And so I'm just wondering if uh, in that front door sort of triage, in addition to inquiring about origin, yes. if there's a sit down and sort of intake about how they arrived there. They do. So in that front door uh, triage uh, service that we have, the uh, intake staff actually do do an intake screening of guests as they enter into the shelter. We want their shelter stay to be brief, right? Uh, and work really hard to figure out what led them uh, to the shelter. Uh, sometimes, if you, as you said, it might have been some uh, tragic circumstance at home uh, in terms of a, a fire. So they would gather that information. Sometimes. Uh, there are fam family reunification issues. Uh, if those sorts of things are identified and we can work to find, you know, re reunite them with a family member who could take them in that evening or the next night or the following night, the shelter staff actually do work hard to figure out ways to avoid their having to stay uh, at the shelter if there are options. The other way that we get um, guest sort of uh, stories or, or profiles is uh, at Woods Mullen, we do have a consumer advisory council. Uh, and so with the women, they do have um, uh, meetings. We're using quality improvement um, techniques to uh, facilitate discussions with the women to focus on how we can make um, their experience at the shelter better. We know that uh, we had had issues around uh, complaints from the guests, and so trying to really zero in on uh, how to make it uh, a better space for them. And I, I'm not sure if okay. you heard some of the remarks that we shared sure. about the improvements, but a lot of the improvements uh, that we're making on the capital side uh, at Woods Mullen. Are informed by the consumer it, Definitely. Advisor. So my question about the intake is really, are we tracking what we learn from those intakes so that we can determine where are their trends? So for example, this council passed the Jim Brick Stabilization Act the mayor signed it. It was not signed at the state house. So I'd be curious, you know, how many people are you seeing in shelter who were there because of eviction? You know, so just better understanding what is the common theme or theme mm -hmm. or what are the trends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I love the individual case management and approach, but are we tracking what we are seeing a critical reoccurrence of? so that we can get at that larger issue. So that's actually information that I can follow up with uh, with our uh, bureau director, okay. um, Jerry Thomas, to okay. see if we can gather some of those sort of trends or things that they're seeing that um, result in homelessness among our guests bo at both shelters for you. Okay, excellent. And then um, for the uh, engagement center, that was, which was the slide? Um, well, there was a, a slide about um, the number of referrals. I think it was the engagement center. Are we also able to track um, sort of soft landing? So after you've had that initial touch, so I, I can't find the slide right now, but there was a, a number that spoke to touches, you know, contact, a number of referrals. And so beyond the referrals, are we able to track how many of them had a soft landing and ended up being gainfully employed or going to the treatment or whatever the service was? I can share with you that the reason why we describe it as being um, low threshold is because we don't actually take an intake, we don't do an intake I form. See. And so in terms of those referrals, their counts, uh, the I staff in the shelter have really close contact. Okay. Um, 
Okay, but thank they, you. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, on the uh, mobile sharps, and I'm sorry I stepped out for a moment, uh, so I missed the full range of Councilor O'Malley's line of questioning. Um, but again, I'm, I'm wondering about trends. Are there any uh, one or two neighborhoods or a park or um, a public facility that have the highest incident? You know, one of the things I'm going to be bring, bringing before the council is the shortage of uh, public facilities uh, of restrooms. And, and it's, 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 you know, our population is growing, and so we've got to be thinking about every amenity. And it seems that in terms of public bathrooms, we are losing them because many of them are becoming needle galleries. We had this, this problem at many of our branch libraries where they were locking their bathrooms um, because they were becoming needle galleries. There's sort of an underground where those battling substance abuse will be communicating with each other about where to go. Um, so I just wanted to understand if there are any trends and if the hurt is in terms of um, uh, needles is being bore by some places and communities or public venues more than others. Um, so you raised two questions, very important issues around um, the bathrooms and then whether there are any hot spots for needles. So I'll take the bathroom question Thank first. You. And actually, through our Bureau of Recovery Services, we actually do have a whole series of materials uh, online. I've actually shared them with other colleagues in other cities because the staff do a great job uh, doing um, overdose trainings specifically for businesses be that have public restrooms because obviously we want to have uh, public restrooms and space for everyone, uh, but we know that this is something that we see in terms of people who are overdosing uh, in restrooms, which is why we've done this training. In terms of hot spots, we do collect information on where um, the um, sharps are collected, and I've seen different versions of the map. Um, they're everywhere, uh, and the mobile sharps unit is deployed, uh, and we can provide that for you. And so is the unit, um, and I, I do want to give a shout out to uh, Carlos Enriquez and others who have, uh, you know, continued to amplify this issue in terms of uh, parks specifically, but are the mobile sharps units dispatched um, based on 311 calls only, or are they, you know, sort of roving or the multiple, going to those, those hot yeah, spots yeah. on their own? Do, is, do, they, do they have to be prompted? There are multiple ways. Yeah, and Jen can probably answer this as well. Do you want to start? Sure. So the Mobile Sharps team has a, they have a daily schedule. Okay. So in high impact areas, uh, they go to every single day. Um, and they cover, um, you know, what you would call hot spot areas every day. And then along with that, they're responding the 3 to 311 calls, calls okay. individually. Great. Um, Thank calls. you. Thank you very much. I would be interested in the hot spots, though. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, in terms of gender, uh, well, before I get to gender, I wanted to ask, how are we accommodating our shelter guests, our LGBT youth specifically, who often speak about feeling unsafe and that there's not really a space for them, or any of our shelter guests that might be members of the community or transitioning, how do we accommodate them right now? We actually, I think, have a policy um, specifically for our LGBT uh, Q guests. I can um, try to track that down for you, but I know that they, uh, the staff work uh, to accommodate them if necessary. I think there have been instances where they've uh, tried to carve out separate space, but I have to uh, make sure I would that definitely that's the like case. to know that. And then, you know, layered on top of that, for our, our LGBT youth specifically, who feel, you know, vulnerable doubly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would like to know not only what our policy is, but what our practice is to keep them safe. Um, and then finally, um, could you just speak to uh, any uh, gender disparities, you know, in the past? Um, you know, as I look at the numbers, you know, here for, for the shelters, there still is a, a higher incident of male shelter guests than there are female shelter guests. But it has been uh, my experience in the past, whether we're talking about um, beds for those experiencing homelessness or for treatment beds, and you know sometimes the two overlap, that there's a disparity 
At one point, what was offered to me is that for every eight beds available for a man, there was only one available for a woman. And I don't know if you all have had the opportunity to do any of that um, deep dive to see if there are disparities in treatment across gender lines, either for recovery or those experiencing homelessness. That's a, I mean, that's a great question. And so I thank you for um, raising that up as an issue in terms of equitable access to care um, based on gender. And I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, okay. but I can come back uh, with more details okay. to see whether we have done a deeper dive um, and done some analysis on that from thank both you. of our bureaus. And then my last question, and I thank the chair for his indulgence, is what are we doing for homeless families? Um, uh, or how are we currently sheltering them? Uh, the family shelter system is actually uh, falls under the state okay. purview. Yes, I keep forgetting about that. Maybe on purpose, because <laughs> I'm frustrated <laughs> by how it's currently being done. So is the state would be the only uh, facilities being provided for someone that might have an infant? There is for anyone that, I mean, I'm just defining family by anyone with a child. Yeah, I mean, I think it really, that, that falls under the state. I mean, what I can share with you uh, that I know anecdotally is that we do have, and this is where, again, back to the engagement center, uh, we do have uh, guests who are married couples, spouses, partners, you know, it, it, one in the Woods Mullen shelter, you know, another in uh, 112 Southampton Street, and the engagement center is where mm -hmm. Uh, they can be together uh, during the day when they're not in those, you know, the the male or the men's or women's shelter. Okay. But we, if, if if you're interested, happy to find out additional information in terms of. Oh no, that's okay. okay. I mean, I can I'll do that that part independently. But okay. I would like to just better understand what trends we're seeing in your front door triage, specifically around eviction, fire, uh, individuals that have criminal records or may have been recently released. Um, and then, again, the gender disparities in terms of treatment beds and homeless beds. And then not only what our policy is when it comes to LGBT, uh, the community, and, and with the youth overlay, but what are our practices? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for those great questions. Thank you. Uh, Council Baker. Um, Jen, you talked about the diversion with Councilor O'Malley, but we just briefly again, so if low-level drug offenders, they bring them to paths and see if they can divert them that way? Correct. Okay. And do you guys have any, um, any sense of what's happening with the Section 35s down there? Like, did the police check in with you at all? Like, we just so you know, we sectioned these two people today or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're working with both the police department, uh, with Judge Coffey from West Roxbury District Court, which is the, the lead on the mass trial court, Section 35 pilot in Boston, as well as the Section 35 programs statewide mm -hmm. um, that are available to coordinate people's care. So uh, we understand that you know some people um, may need a section um, as a last resort, but we want to make sure that we're there when they get sectioned in care to connect with them um, and to coordinate their, uh, you know, their exit plan, plan, whatever their, their plan, plan is. And, and, and what's the sense of the, like how often are we using that, the sections? How Like how many people a week say are, are the police sectioning? I'd have to get you that data. I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, but they do coordinate with someone at PATH or someone mm -hmm. someone in, in your shop. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. Um, the, the Suffolk County recovery panel, how is that going? And, and um, I saw you, you, somebody was at 12 recovery panels were attended. So what are, what are our action items coming out of those? How are we working with South Bay? And, and can you explain that relationship a little bit? What's, is it a success or? Sure. Um, yes, I think it's been very successful. It's the first of its kind. We modeled it after the, um, after the reentry panel. Um, in the violence world and really um, took that model into Suffolk House of Corrections, both men and women and Nashua Street. So there are three panels every month mm -hmm. that are attended by community providers, uh, faith-based groups, provi uh, treatment providers, mental health providers, whatnot, are welcome to come in and meet with folks prior to their release to make those connections, give them information, and make sure they know w in what community 
uh, resources are available for them when they come out. So that's been very successful. Oh, excellent. So, so you, so if someone may be from Chelsea or whatever, they, they, they're able to speak to services in Chelsea and, and, and get them on their path. Right. Excellent. That sounds really good. Um, in the engagement center, again, how long do you think that that, this may be for you, Monica, or, or, mm -hmm. or Jen, how long do we think that that planning, that, that study is going to happen? When do we think, like, we'll have a, we'll have a sense of what's, what we should be doing, where it should be built, and, and um, you know, what it will look like? Well, you know, we've been having discussions and making improvements along the way during this pilot phase, but I think the planning in earnest will happen um, July 1st. Um, oh. so, so we need the planning this, process. Okay. And, and is that slated for a year, one year plan? I, I don't anticipate that it would take a year since we have some good experience under our belt, but yeah, yeah we, I, I think we would have to, we will work with Jen and Chief Martinez and obviously the mayor and other partners. So I know that um, when we first designed the pilot, we worked closely with Commissioner Christopher on that front. So there are multiple departments and colleagues who've been involved in the planning and implementation. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm a big fan of the engagement center and a big fan of Devin and a big fan of Jen and, 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 and everybody that works over there, Sarah, Sarah Mack, and it's, it's yeoman's work. We're, we're, we're totally swamped with it. And um, with that being said, I would like to somewhat be briefed or involved in the Long sure. Island sort of planning because in my district I have Long Island is mine and also the Southampton Carter is mine, and um, I was at the Quincy meeting last Thursday night, and um, they aren't very happy. So I think that that we should really be thinking about how we move forward with all of this. Um, you know, come up with a good plan. I'd like to, if if I'm allowed to be involved in that plan, and and, and you know, not to just to be another person, another thought, another sort of uh, opinion. But thank you, and Jen, thank you for, for you know, the work. I know it's difficult, and, and it seems like we're serving, like Councilor Asabi George talks about, I know we're serving a lot of the region here, and, and we don't want to say you can't come to Boston, but because we do it, we do it the best, I think, because you guys do it the best, that's why people are coming here. So if we're able to, um, I think, do something out at Long Island that will will potentially be just additional services. I don't think that we're looking to take everything that's happening and and put it over there. I think it's I think we have an opportunity to to, to think long term with something like this and I, I look forward to the planning of it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, we've been joined by District City Councilor Ed Flynn. Uh, Councilor Janey has the oh no Councilor Janey. Councilor Savi George. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just, following up on Councilor Baker's last comment about us doing some of these services the best in the city of Boston, I think one of the challenges is that many cities and towns don't do it at all. Mm -hmm. And we really need the, the rest of the Commonwealth, but the rest of the region to also be providing these services in their cities and towns to help, to help their residents and support their residents. Um, what is the, um, just to follow up on Councilor Presley's uh, questions about the Mobile Sharps team, um, what is a typical turnaround time with a 311 call for Mobile Sharps? It's fairly prompt. I mean, depending on where they're at, you know, in, in the schedule, I don't have the exact time. Jen might have it in terms of um, sort of a estimated time from call to Arrival. Yeah, I would, I would say day of, mm -hmm. um, if not sooner. Um, and if the call comes in after hours, then it, you know, it would be the next morning, the right. next day. Yeah, I think it would be, um, I think the Mobile Sharps team, I think, does a really great job mm -hmm. responding uh, when they get a 311 call. So I think that maybe something, hopefully that day there was something to brag about, that turnaround time. I mean, they're driving yeah. um, from East Boston to Brighton sometimes and mm -hmm. all over the city. So certainly that is a factor. Mm -hmm. um, but with the, in, with the investment of the additional two FTEs this past year, I think has helped in that response time and yeah. able to do the regular sweeps as well as respond to 311. Uh, it would also, I think it would also be helpful to understand whether or not we need to still increase that number. Um, you know, some, some similarly sized cities have up to 10 folks on their mobile sharps teams. Wow. 
Um, I don't know if you had something else to add there. That was impressive, the number 10. <laughs> yeah, that would be great, wouldn't it? Um, especially when we think about some of the other work that the Mobile Sharps teams do. They're not just picking up needles. They are right. building and having relationships with individuals who are um, suffering from addiction and homelessness at the same time. Can we um, talk a little bit about uh, what's happening with the PATHS program, um, just in general, and you know, a little bit of a story about that? So, um, PATHS is really, um, has been, um, you know, it's unique. There isn't anything like it uh, in the state in terms of the services that we're able to provide. We, we had just been, Jen and I were actually in a conversation uh, yesterday um, praising the program and the, the work that they do because it's uh, high traffic in terms of individuals who come in and um, really impressive in terms of the way that uh, our staff are able to help clients navigate a really complex system of care depending on what type of services. Uh, we had a, a group of visitors from the National League of Cities in last week and they asked about whether there was like this master database that the staff were using uh, to help individuals who were seeking care um, make their way through the uh, maze. And what, what I can share with you, and Jen will probably echo this, I hope, is that the staff have developed really strong relationships with different treatment providers to the level that you know I, I didn't quite appreciate until that visit that if they have an individual client and that person um, smokes, they can, and, and a lot of our clients do smoke, that they can easily zero in on which um, detox or care facilities do not allow smoking. And that's not the place that we're going to take uh, our clients. But uh, there's definitely a need uh, to hopefully work with the state. I know the commissioner had been thinking about this in my early discussions with her, expanding it and using that model and spreading it throughout the state to your point that it, you know we shouldn't bear the burden of serving because we've uh, created this strong system of care. Yeah, sure. And just to add to uh, Monica's thoughts um, and echo that, the past program we have done trainings um, across the state around access to care and how to um, navigate the system and the PATH program is, is being looked at as the model for that. So expanding that to other communities down the Cape, Western Mass, other other communities that could use a similar service um, is happening and so we hope that the state will move forward in funding some other communities for, for that service. Uh, PATH is placing up to 20 uh, people a day um, who walk in or call on the helpline to treatment placement. Uh, they get them there through providing transportation as well, which is why they're so successful. So outside of Boston, inside of Boston, outside of Boston, the metro area as far out as uh, Worcester, Brockton, Tewksbury, uh, where the treatment beds are available that day. Last year, uh, they placed over 2,600 people in treatment from that program. Um, so those are some of the things to brag about. Um, and do point. we do we think the increase, because through last year's budget process, there was an increase in hours and sort of resources that were available to individuals. So we're seeing a, retur a good return on that investment. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I mean, I also think that the way that we sequenced and the investments that were made in terms of, um, the, for example, the investments that were made to keep um, the engagement center paths a hope open through the weekends and extended hours those three locations work very closely in terms of when um, when one of our uh, staff at the engagement center encounters someone who's ready for treatment they can walk them right over to paths or vice versa if we're full in the engagement center they serve as surge capacity so there's lots of good collaboration among those three programs Right. Where are the three locations for paths? Well, the, well Pat, no, I meant between the engagement center paths and a oh, okay. I mean, the way that we've uh, set up the schedule is that they, they're able to work together, right? I because there was initially in the pilot, the engagement with center was open for extended periods of time. And that wasn't, we, we had to also expand the hours uh, at paths and also a -Hope. So those investments were helpful. Because yeah, paths is just that single point, you know, it's at exactly. um, on um, Albany. Albany. Right. And then can we talk a little bit about the investment in and how the work is happening now at the engagement center where sort of the challenges are and how we can better respond to the challenges? 
So I think, um, I think some of the challenges, um, I think most of the challenges I would say have been structural um, because it is um, a fabric uh, storage tent. Um, we've worked really hard to uh, flip it and create a welcoming space, but the winter was really hard on the engagement center in terms of the floors, uh, the heat, uh, Grace and her team at Property uh, worked with us to try to make improvements to keep it uh, well heated, particularly in that um, cold winter stretch that we had. Um, we, we also um, had, if you recall in December, there was a, a gas leak which um, forced us to do an emergency evacuation of the shelter and also the engagement center. And, and while that was being repaired, we had to uh, create swing space in the Finland building. And I think you know, what that proved to us was the importance of uh, figuring out what, how to move it forward from a pilot in that temporary uh, fabric space into a permanent structure. Uh, because it was really tough having um, operations totally switched over to the uh, Finland building where we actually have other programs and staff. Uh, we, you know, staff did as well as could be expected, but we were, we were happy to, and the clients, happy to get back into the engagement center. They've remediated the property around the engagement center. But I mean, I think a lot of the challenges have been structural. Um, I, I think um, with this new investment, we are going to be able to staff up. So we have a program director that we'll be able, uh, that we have in place. And then I think we continue to work with the state, to your point, in terms of um, bearing or shouldering the burden of um, engaging clients that might not be Boston residents, have had good um, productive discussions uh, with the state in the last fiscal year. The state contributed, the State Department of Public Health contributed $250,000 uh, to our efforts at the Engagement Center, and Grace is, uh, and I are working closely with Commissioner Burrell uh, and Jen and Devin uh, to identify what additional resources they can contribute in this next fiscal year, particularly since it's in our FY19 budget. Um, but I, I mean, I think structural would be the biggest challenges at this point and making sure that we're continuing to provide the level of service. Do you wanna add other challenges? I would, just, I would just add, you know, another challenge, which is also an opportunity by the engagement center being there, but the, the population that um, does spend time at, at the center is a very um, challenging population, uh, many of which have spent decades out um, on the street and so the opportunity is that we have a place for them to go and we're able to start coordinating more of their care across um, services. But again, uh, it's, you know, there's, the engagement center has provided a spot for people to go, which is, which is great. And then the work is just beginning now that we're, you know, through the pilot phase, I would say. And then what about um, the, w between the engagement center and Southampton Street Shelter, the, um, the engagement with, the other uh, property owners, the both, you know, the city fire department is there, there are some private businesses there, there are some agencies that provide other um, social services that are in that immediate area. What's the relationship with those partners and both, you know, the good parts and the bad parts? I think, I mean, I think the good part is that they've, we really have rallied around uh, creating this welcoming space. I mean, we work with Newmarket. They, provide donations, they uh, work with us uh, to ensure that it is, um, that they have palm cards uh, to direct their business. Owners have palm cards so if they you know, encounter someone and they need to refer them or send them somewhere. So I think we have a really, we've developed a good relationship in terms of referrals and building the engagement center and the services together. I think uh, you know, some probably ongoing challenges would be to maintain this level of urgency, the sense of urgency in keeping the engagement center open and uh, making sure that we have appropriate resources and good communication across the neighborhood uh, in terms of the different types of things that we uh, provide. So uh, we do that in a number of different ways and Jen really does, with Devin, lead a lot of those uh, community-based efforts and you know discussions, particularly with Commissioner Finn and New Market Square, the neighborhood associations. Um, you know, again, going back to the uh, National League of Cities visit, uh, we had um, Stephen Fox 
uh, joined us in our uh, discussions. He was the keynote speaker that we uh, had because the other uh, mayors who were there and the police chiefs wanted to understand how do we engage community uh, in Boston and our efforts around recovery services. And so he really was uh, part of our team that uh, presented sort of our experience in our neighborhood from a community perspective. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, um, we, the tremendous amount of work we've done developing relationships, you're, you're at the meetings as well in, in your area and we, and we value the partnerships and it's taken a lot of hard work to sort of educate and inform people but also to consistently be at the table with them to try to tackle this really complex issue which uh, really there is no silver bullet for. I think that, um, and the you know, the crowds move, they merge in different areas, and, and each time we try to reach out, um, or we're reached out to from a community, and we try to be there and work on um, really tactical issues that we can all solve. So that's with partners from public safety, public health, many city departments, and then business owners and community. Right now we're meeting every other week with um, the block of Atkinson, Southampton, and Topeka Street because of the way the crowds have have moved. You're meeting with who? We're meeting with business owners, com community. Within that, yep, within with that market, section. With, yeah. Within that block, right? Because I'd say some of, some of the visual things that um, I see personally mm -hmm. and that we hear of um, is this um, increase in, you know, certainly people that are suffering and need um, care but also a, a significant increase, I'd say, in trash, a significant increase probably in some um, significant criminal activity. There have been incidences down there recently that have not been great. So can we talk a little bit about the partnership, both with the individuals who use the engagement center, the shelter, but then also that utilize some of those other resources down there. And y there are times where it becomes a little bit of a, um, it can, can become a problem, a public safety issue. Mm -hmm. And it has been become a public safety issue when we've got sort of lots of different interests um, and challenges colliding all at once in that, that one area. So can we talk a little bit about sort of the presence on the street from the Health Commission, but then also in partnership, because it's not all, all, not all on your back. There's a lot of other things happening down there, and we need that, those additional resources and support. Now, what, the, what are the, the clinics that are down there? What sort of support are they offering sure. on the street level, sort of out the in the public and, and really helping people get to where they need to mm -hmm. be? And then also sort of keeping that area clean. So on the street level, I can say that, you know, we just focused our remarks on the um, our street engagement, our street outreach workers, but there is a coordinated uh, patrol, not patrol, sort of a coordinated schedule that we do with multiple partners in the community uh, with recovery service, our recovery services bureau. So definitely there's a, uh, across the different shelters and then um, clinics in the area, they do do um, a schedule, so it's not just our street workers that are doing that engagement on, on the street level. I think what you're pointing out, and we see it because we drive by, we're in, mm -hmm. we're there every day and on the weekends and in the evening, some of those structural changes that you saw, and we've heard this in the community meetings with the additional fencing on Mass Ave, has pushed um, uh, individuals, the garbage that we see piling up and other things out into, you know, down, um, Mass Ave towards Columbia, behind uh, New Market and, and other neighborhoods. And I think where we, we have seen that we have worked as a good team with Public Works and BPD to enhance bike patrols, to help with trash pickups. So we do this routinely, um, you know, call each other, email each other if we're, you know, after hours or if we see something uh, to engage our other city partners in helping us address some of those things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Council Presley. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just curious, do our shelter guests have access to the internet? Are there computers or? I am 
The engagement center is the, uh, we have several computers in the engagement center, but I don't think we have any computers in the shelter, but. We don't have computers in the shelter right now. Our CTO has been working with Do It to actually get wicked free Wi-Fi access there. So we're actually working on that pathway. Yes. For those that might have smartphones and mm -hmm. things like that, so they can stay connected to family or search for employment. So we're, where are we with that? We are working on that. So the engagement center has several computers. We also have computers at 1022 Mass Ave, which is working with our homeless guests to get employment. Okay. That's our employment center. Okay. Um, we're identifying resources for that, and we are coordinating with DOA to actually get that Wi-Fi access there. Okay. But for all of our shelters? Yes. We're okay. actually working to modernize all of our IT okay. for our clients as well as our employees. Okay. So this is a, a process we're undergoing right now, and access for the clients is one of our prime concerns. Okay. Do you have a timeline in mind for that, just since we are, this is a fiscal question, you know, investment in sort of technology and and things like that. So is there a rough plan to um, when you would like to, to be at a point where all of those investments and upgrades have happened? We're hoping by the end of next year. Okay. So that we're replacing our cabling now and then we've got a whole series of IT infrastructure. Okay. And then we have to identify some computers and get them ready and deploy them. And actually our most challenging issue may actually just be finding space within the shelters because they are very busy and getting designated spacing for that. Okay. Um, and then uh, I think my final question, at least for this round, is um, do, um, I know Pine Street Inn does work to civically engage their shelter guests. I was just wondering, do we um, offer voter registration forms? What are we doing around, you know, civic engagement and to make sure folks are educated uh, about upcoming elections and the like? We have done a lot uh, with the last uh, presidential election and throughout the, uh, the year uh, do uh, voter registration uh, drives at the both shelters. I know government, our, our staff in the executive office have done that and program staff have volunteered to go down to the shelter to help with okay. uh, voter registration. Okay, so we great. do do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Siomo. And uh, thank you guests for being here and um, I just want to say to first of all say to Jen I've seen you at so many meetings and see see you on the helping so many people across the city we just want to say thank you to for your dedicated work you're doing you're doing an excellent job um, I know there's a in terms of the salt end there's a severe concentration of recovery services there um, I know residents are very sympathetic and very compassionate trying to help help the community suffering from substance abuse. Along with Andrew Square in South Boston, there's a lot of um, substance abuse uh, programs. But is there um, any plans to, you know, make sure every neighborhood also um, is able to contribute to helping, helping those su suffering from substance abuse, not just concentrating it on a few, a few neighborhoods? So it's a really good question in terms of access uh, to services. And um, so one resource, um, you know, our, our programs, we've talked a bit about what we offer through the Boston Public Health Commission. While they're in our neighborhood in the South End, Roxbury, we actually also have uh, resources available in Metapan. Uh, on our campus there, so we have several residential uh, rehabilitation programs uh, cited there. And then all of our services are obviously offered citywide. We work closely with our Boston Community Health Centers, uh, and they're in most of our neighborhoods throughout the city, and I know that they've done a lot of work uh, to uh, integrate uh, behavioral health and substance use um, treatment services within their primary care setting, uh, but they still have a long way to go. Um, when we talk with them, they, they admit that they still have a, lot, a long way to go. Uh, but, but that would be another, I think, resource or service that you know, I would highlight that extends the work that we do uh, in the commission uh, across different neighborhoods. I would just add um, Long Island. So uh, planning for Long Island and, and really thinking about a comprehensive uh, recovery campus out on Long Island would be our, you know, really our next goal for any new services. Mm -hmm. I was a, before this job, I was a probation officer for 10 years um, 
at Suffolk Superior Court supervising the homeless community. And I would often visit Long Island for almost a 10 year period. And at that time, um, this is the previous administration, going over that bridge was, was very scary. I thought that bridge should have been shut down years ago. Um, but I, I do think the, the mayor made an excellent choice of, of, of closing that bridge immediately. And I'm proud of what he's accomplished since that. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a credit to you and to your team for, for working hard and making sure that those that left the island also got the treatment um, that they needed as well. Um, in, in my district, I think I have a, maybe three or four um, homeless shelters. I have Pine Street Inn, St. Francis House, Boston Rescue, New England Center for Homeless Veterans as well. Um, what can what can the business community do to help on this crisis? Can they play a key role? Can they do something specifically to help those suffering from substance abuse and in, in, in being part of the solution? I know there are some that are doing great work, but overall, what what could they do? Do you want to start? Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I think there's um, there's a lot they can do. Where we've engaged a lot of uh, businesses um, on a variety of fronts. Uh, first and, and foremost, on the ground in their neighborhood um, and, and where they are to be educated on the population and be part of the solution either by investment or um, as in the case of the engagement center, what we've learned is that businesses have um, participated in giving back in ways, just recently we had some file cabinets um, that we needed a business donated, brand new file cabinets, great. We can always use that kind of stuff. So I think there's a variety of ways that they can help. Um, and we've met with them and Monica and I met with some of the business associations mm -hmm. and came up with some ideas as well that I can't mm -hmm. remember right now. I was just gonna jump in. I mean, I think one way that um, we could push business businesses to help us in this because your question is good a good one I, I think is around raising awareness and um, there's still a lot of stigma around addiction and yet it, it impacts everyone uh, loved ones family members employees and so I think where we could partner with businesses might be to um, raise awareness share stories of people who might come forward who work in different employment business settings to share their um, recovery stories mm -hmm. and their struggles and challenges. So I, I definitely think there could be more opportunities to engage uh, businesses in raising awareness around stigma. Thank you for taking my questions. Uh, Council Presley, do you have any more questions? You all set? Great. That concludes uh, the morning session and uh, we will adjourn this and reconvene at two o'clock. Okay. Great. This hearing is adjourned.